That's why you use travel mugs. It's half full of coffee, you just never know it. I'm just going to go ahead and leave that closed. All right. Well, as I said, we are in the book of Acts, and we are continuing to uh, work through the, the events surrounding uh, Peter's vision and the vision of Cornelius uh, and, and how, how God brought in his perfect timing uh, these two men together so that God could move the gospel forward. We have to fundamentally understand that's what God's goal was. In, in giving a vision to Cornelius and giving a vision to Peter to bring them together, it was to teach Peter that we cannot assume that we always know what God is doing. Nor that we should look at people and say, you're not worthy of the gospel simply because you're not Jewish. And you know, I'll just say, as we said uh, last time, it's easy for us to do that. It's easy for us to do that as people, even as Christians, to look and say, you know what? At the end of the day, I'm a Christian. I go to church. I live differently. I'm better than you. I'm more moral than you. I'm more ethical than you. So you don't deserve the message that I carry with me. Okay, and that's a dangerous place to be. Okay, that's a very dangerous place for us to be as people. And, and, and we should be looking at people the way that God does. He loves each and every one of the, the people that are on the face of this planet. He created them. They're made in his image, and he wants them to be with them with him for eternity. That's the awesome part about God. And what's awesome about being part of the church is we have the blessing and the privilege of being a part of what he's doing to reach those people whom he loves. We are part of God's great plan to reach the Gentiles with the gospel. Let me just say this. We are the Gentiles. We are the furthest reaches of the gospel at this point. Not that it's not beyond us. That's not what I'm saying. But but, but he said in Jerusalem, Judea, and then to the ends of the earth, right? And that gospel movement has been moving forward ever since. That's partly where we derive the, the term for our study, or the, the title for our study, Unstoppable. Join the movement, right? That's the idea, is that the gospel is going forward, and it is not going to stop until there is one from every tribe, language, and nation represented before the throne of grace. It's an amazing thing to be a part of. And, and so Peter was shown by God that there was no distinction between who could receive the gospel and who could not. In fact, that all men needed to repent of sin and look to Christ as their substitution and then, and then accept that free gift that he was offering. That any who believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And so this morning as we move, or this evening is, man, I don't even know what time of day it is. Uh, this evening as we get into our passage... From Acts chapter 11, what's interesting is I want us to, to kind of think about the power of our testimony. The power of our testimony. You see, because if we know Christ, then every one of us has a story. Okay, every one of us has something to share. Every one of us can talk about our personal experience as a validation to the truth of God's scripture. You see, this is one of the things that's cool about your testimony, is that it's yours. It's what God has done in your life. It's how he's changed you. It's what he's doing in your life. Your experience, your story. And what that, what that does is, is we, we anchor that to the truth of Scripture. Our, our, our testimony is linked and cannot be any other way but to the Scriptures. So when we talk about Christ in our life, it, it automatically should direct us back to the Scriptures, right? To what God has done through the scriptures, how he's teaching us through the scriptures, all the things that, and how we've been saved through the scriptures. You see how it, it's not just my story and therefore it's true. No, it's my story because it's from God's word and how God's word has impacted me through the person of Jesus Christ. It's based upon the truth of scripture at work in you. And although every one of our experiences will be different, it should always point back to Jesus. So we have to look at a testimony in a couple of different ways. Number one, it may be something specific in a certain moment that God is doing. God answered a prayer request, for example. We saw God move. We, that's a testimony to God's faithfulness and goodness at work in your life in a particular moment. This could be um, also what God has done in your life in general. You can share your whole story. 
I, I love being able to share my story with people who haven't heard it before. And, and, and not because my story is better than somebody else's story, but because to me, it's amazing how God's worked in my life. What he's brought me through, where he's brought me through. And really, we're supposed to encourage one another with, with what God is doing in our life, aren't we? In fact, that's what in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 11 it talks about. Therefore, encourage one another, build one another up just as you are doing. We're supposed to encourage each other, build each other up. And what better way to encourage somebody than to share what it is that God is doing? Now, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 to 25 says, And let us consider how to stir one another, one another up. Uh, to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us encourage. Let's figure out how we can stir each other up. And I'll tell you what, if you don't get pumped up and encouraged by hearing what God is doing in somebody else's life, check your pulse. Make sure you're still alive. Because God is on the move. God is always working. God wants us to share what he's doing. We don't need to feel shame. We don't need to be embarrassed about it. We just need to be honest about how good God is. Now, why do I say all that? Well, because when it comes to the preaching of the gospel, there are always going to be people in the church, I might even say, as we're going to see, who might question why you would talk to certain people, why you would share the gospel with them, and, and, and really kind of have this cynical attitude. But as we see in the end of chapter 10 in verses 44 to 48, it says, When Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed. The Jews that were with Peter were amazed because of the gift of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the Gentiles. Or I like the way it says in the scriptures, out even on the Gentiles. Not just the Jews, but even on the Gentiles. To them, this was mind-blowing that God was doing this thing. And for hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God, and Peter declared... Uh, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people? We who have received the Holy, or who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. So this is the end of where we left off. People were getting saved. The Holy Spirit was falling upon people. The gifts, uh, the sign gifts that we see in the book of Acts were, were, were being practiced. People were being baptized. It was a phenomenal time in Caesarea where the Gentiles were getting saved. Now, have you ever been on one of those spiritual highs and you come around somebody and they just crush it for you? Has there been around? Like, it's not, not, I don't think that people are mean, but it's just like all of a sudden there's, there's that one person who feels like they need to bring you back to reality. Well, don't get ex too excited. It's not always going to be like that. You're like, why do you have to talk? Like, this was awesome. And then you started talking and it just killed it. You see, there are people like that. And so Peter, as he remained there, he eventually had to go back. Now, sometimes that's what we have to do. Sometimes the, the, we, we're in this ministry situation, but we have to go back and we have to get plugged back in. And this is an awesome opportunity to share what God's doing. And it's something that, that I think we need to maybe do more, even in this church. What is God doing? How is God working in your life? I remember being uh, in church as a, as a young, young 17, 18-year-old and just being kind of amazed that, that the pastor would hold the microphone up and say, would any, does anybody have anything to share that they want, they want to say about what God's doing in their life this week? And it, was not, it wasn't amazing that the pastor would offer the microphone. What was amazing was that, that people actually stood up and took the microphone in front, of, in front of 300 other people. I was just like, man, you guys are crazy. Who stands up in front of that many people and actually says stuff? Lo and behold, the pastor some number of years later, right? But it's one of those things. It's like it was cool because you, you heard from normal, everyday people, normal people who had stories to share about God. And so Peter gets back and he reports to the church what God was doing in Caesarea. And you can almost picture that excitement. Like I said, you, you got the spiritual high, lots of cool stuff. 
And, and he was excited to come back to the church in Jerusalem to let people know that, that these people had been saved, that God had done a work. He was so pumped. But yet, then he gets this mixed response from the, from the people in Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem. And check it out in Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, where it says, Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And so Peter went up to Jerusalem. The circumcision, par circumcision party, that is the Jews, criticized him, saying, You went to the uncircumcised men and ate with them? You see, word obviously traveled fast, okay? Because Peter gets back, and people in Judea had already heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. So he gets back to Judea, and uh, his Christian brothers, his Jewish Christian brothers, had heard about what was happening. Now, I do want to point out that these cynics are in every church. Every church has a cynic. Every church has a, the, whatever you want to call them. But there's always somebody who's going to look for something negative. Now, I'm not saying that because, and you know, it could be us at times. Any one of us could be a cynic at times. I know I've probably been a cynic at times. Okay, but the reality is, is we don't want to let God's amazing work be diminished because we have a bad attitude, or it's not the way that things have always been. Or, you know what, we don't understand the intentions of people, or maybe we just don't think or have the proper perspective. You see, if we look at this, really what these believers in Judea had that had issue with what was happening, they had the wrong focus. If we look at chapter 11, verse 3, what does it say? Here's their complaint in verse 3. You went to the uncircumcised men and ate with them. <laughs> what does that have to do with anything at this point? Do you guys ever did you notice that? I like the way the, the Bible knowledge commentary frames it. It says the accusation lodged against Peter was that he went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. The primary problem was not the preaching to the Gentiles, but the eating with them. This gives even greater significance to Peter's vision. Eating with someone was the mark of acceptance and fellowship. The problem could have caused a serious break in the church. So now what we're going to see is that Peter is going to explain himself to these cynics, to these people who are more worried about the fact that he fellowshiped with and embraced a Gentile by having a common meal together. And so it says in verse 4, and Peter uh, began and explained to them in order. This is, where, this is where your testimony gets cool. Because sometimes when we have a testimony, when somebody comes up to you and they, they maybe make an argument like this one, like you went and ate with these uncircumcised Gentiles, you can say, well, let me tell you what God did to bring me to that moment. And then all of a sudden they get some clarity. And that's what Peter does. So he began to explain to them and it says, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts uh, of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing uncommon or unclean has ever entered my mouth. So he's reciting exactly what happened. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived in the, at the house which, in which we were, sent from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me, Go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel stand in the house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter, and he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us, 
when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Now, Peter does some amazing things here. First, he talks about it was God who gave the vision to Peter to not call what he has made common or unclean. Then he talks about it was God who gave Cornelius the vision to go and send his men and bring Peter to Caesarea. And how God had put his Holy Spirit out upon these Gentile believers just as he did with us. Now this is where it gets cool. Because he said, God not only did for us this amazing thing in giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit, he also gave it to them. And then he brings up what we find in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. He says, isn't this what John talked about? In Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, this is John. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me will, is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You see, John, the Baptist, before Christ started his earthly ministry, told and, and said, you know what? There's one who's coming after me, and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's going to be the one. And he says, and Peter brings this up to, to say, look, this is God's plan. This is what he wants for his church. And he closes with this little statement where he says, and who am I to stand in God's way. Now, I don't know about you. Who, who can argue with that? Right? God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed. So who am I to stand in God's way? I tell you what, there's one place you don't want to be as a believer. It's in God's way. Right? You don't want to be standing going against the flow that God is and direction that God is going in. Number one, it's a losing battle. You'll never win. It will, it, will only, it will only really be bad for you, not anybody else. But there's a lot in that statement that Peter makes. He says, this is God's will. This is God's work. And so who am I? Who am I? Have you ever stopped and asked yourself that question? Who am I? It's a good question to ask yourself. Who am I in light of what God is doing? Who am I in the grand scheme of things? And, and you may come to the conclusion that, that maybe like James, you say, well, my life is but a vapor. It's here got one minute and gone the next. And that's very true. It's like my eight-year-old daughter says, man, time flies. Right? But that little vapor in the grand scheme of eternity can accomplish so much if we understand that not only that God loves us and wants us to be with him for all eternity, but that in the process, God wants to use us to transform the lives of others. Who am I? It's a good question to ask because if we know the scriptures and we know the truth of God, if we know Jesus Christ, then we know that we are a child of God. It means we are loved by God. It means that we are, we are called unto a higher calling, a, a greater purpose in life. We are redeemed, we are reconciled, we have been bought back, and therefore we have purpose. We have meaning. We can go forward now in the victory that we have been given in Jesus Christ. Matthew Henry writes this, he says, Note, those who hinder the conversion of soul, souls withstand God. And those who take too much upon them to contrive how to exclude them from communion, those whom God has taken into communion with himself. He says, you know what, Matthew, I love Matthew Henry. He's so blunt and to the point. You make plans to stand against God. Woe unto you. God wants he wants you to be a part of that. And I love the way that Peter in this moment doesn't try to explain theologically the importance of the gospel going to the Gentiles, does he? He simply says, let me tell you 
what God did to bring me to this point. Because there is something powerful, is there not? When we say, when, when there is somebody, a critic, a cynic, or somebody who doesn't want to believe what, you, what just happened, and we say, well, let me tell you how God brought me there. Because who are they to argue with what God has done for you? How are they to argue against what you have seen, what you have heard, what you have known to be true? But to stand in God's way is to say, I don't, or I think I know better than God. But as a servant of Christ, why don't we just subject ourselves to his will? Tell others about Jesus as we tell others what God has done for us. You see, because the best way to silence a critic is to direct them back to God. Amen? Because check out what it says in verse 18. When they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. All of a sudden, at the end of Peter's testimony, they were singing a different tune, weren't they? They fell silent. What do you say to that? I'm sure all those people were like, you ate with uncircumcised men? They're like, I got nothing. I'm just going to sit over here and shut up and pretend I didn't say anything to begin with. Right? But notice how they didn't just say, well, I can't say anything against that. But, but they went full blow in the opposite direction. They said, you know what? I'm going to praise God for this. I'm going to glorify God and saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. I remember in high school, um, we, we used to have this Christian club. We had about 40 or 50 uh, kids from our youth group that would go there. It was, it was every Tuesday, and we would have this, this club. And it, it, was, it was a good, good group of people. We had, we had awesome pastors and teachers that would come in every week and, and teach these young people basically what it was to be a Christian, what it was to walk with Christ, what it was to read your Bible, all of the, those things. But I remember, I, I never forgot what this one pastor from, it was, it was Church of the Woods, and, and he came in and he said, every time somebody gets saved, there's a party in heaven. That never left me. And he says, if God gets excited because one person gets saved, shouldn't we? And I almost think that, that that's what Peter's going for here. Like, God just did an amazing work among the Gentiles in Caesarea. Amazing work. He poured out the Holy Spirit. We saw the manifestation of that Spirit. We, we, we baptized them ourselves. Shouldn't we all be excited about that? Shouldn't we all be pumped up? And they turned and glorified God. And when I was in Bible school, I remember uh, it was a missionary who had come back from the field, and he was in his interim time teaching. And I always remember he wore a blue blazer. I can't remember his name, but every day he came to class. He was, he was this kind of tall, skinny guy, uh, short, brown hair. He wore, wore this blue blazer. I can't remember his name. But I remember it, we, were, we were talking one day. It wasn't in class. It was after class. And we were talking about the Lord's will and how do we know what the Lord's will is and, and all of these things. And, and, and I just remember him saying, the one thing that you can never really question in the life of another believer is when they say, God is leading me to do this. He says, because who am I to question God's leading in the life of another? Now, obviously, we question if it doesn't line up with Scripture at all. But, I mean, if that person is walking in the will of the Lord, walking according to the Spirit, and the Lord is leading them to, to go into the mission field or go into the pastorate or go into Sunday school teaching or, or go in and, and helping people, whatever the scenario is, who are we to argue that that's God's will for their life? Who are we to stand in the way of where God is leading? And so as we close tonight, I really want to challenge us to first and foremost not be cynical when God is moving. It's easy to do. We can all fall into the trap. And like I said, I've fallen into that trap before. But let's not be cynical when somebody says, check out what God is doing. 
Okay, but also let's let's use the things that God is doing in our life and He's showing us to further His kingdom, to share with other people the goodness and grace of God as He's worked in and through us to impact the lives of others. And the last thing I want to say is don't stand in the way of God. If God is leading you and God is moving in your heart and life, then let Him lead, let Him move and follow where He goes. And watch what happens. That's what Peter did, isn't it? That's what Cornelius did. And check out what happened there. People got saved. They were baptized. They received the gift of the Holy Spirit. But then you go back to, to Judea and you have all these cynical Jewish believers that are now rejoicing and glorifying God because of what God did in Caesarea through Peter. It's pretty amazing. Let's get excited about what God's doing. Let's share with other people so that they can get excited to encourage one another with these things. Well, let's close in prayer and then we will dismiss you guys. God, thank you so much for your love and grace. Thank you for Jesus. God, as we look at this story, it wasn't Peter's message. It wasn't Cornelius and his message. No, it was the message of Jesus. Peter simply went to the people that God led him to go to. And they got saved as a result of your finished work on the cross. They heard the good news and they believed. And God, we all have, God, we all have that, that wonderful truth before us that you loved us and you died for us and you rose again in victory over sin and death. God, thank you so much that if that's a part of our story, Lord, we can now take that and share it with other people how you've changed us. And Lord, may that story of how you've changed us impact others as we point people to Jesus. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, thank you so much for coming. I'll see you next Wednesday, Jeremy. Okay, sounds good, buddy. Yes, sir.